there was a, a young woman who wrote for the Dodge uh, College of Film and Media Arts site and mentioned how she had become a writer and that a lot of people had warned her ahead of time that this is a cutthroat business and she wanted to make it more of a collaboration. She says, you're in these writers' rooms, you have to make it a collaboration. How does someone do that? How does someone thrive in a competitive situation? Or maybe it's not, maybe there's some fallacy behind that. Look, you're gonna encounter both. If, if you're fortunate enough to be, well, whatever you become, whether it's in the entertainment industry or in the drapery business, you're gonna meet nice people, you're gonna meet not nice people. You're gonna meet people who are generous and collaborative, and you're gonna meet people who will throw you under the bus. And uh, I prefer <laughs> the nicer version of this. When I was a, a showrunner, uh, the head writer on a sitcom, on sitcoms, um, I tried to create that environment in the writer's room that we're here to help each other, not to one-up each other or anything, because you're in that room for a long time, and week after week, month after month, I think you get better creative work out of people when you do that. But not everybody, um, not everybody behaves that way. There, are, there are some showrunners who are notoriously not nice people. There, I read about one in the newspaper. I won't name names here, where the showrunner said to another writer who eventually became quite successful herself, was just screaming at her in the hallway about how bad her script was. To which she said. Do you want to go into your office or is public humiliation part of what you're going for here? Which he found funny and then still berated her about her script. So I, I don't work well personally in that environment. So you try and get along with people. But I, I've also been not been the boss in other rooms where the showrunner was tough to work for and you have to learn how to um, succeed in that environment too and how to make that work for yourself. Or if you get to a situation that's just unbearable, really hard to do when you're getting your first job, so you probably wouldn't do it there, but sometimes you have to say, life's too short and I'm, I'm not gonna work in this environment and move away. So since we're all humans, we all have our good days, bad days, everybody has an ego, everybody has some type of agenda, whatever it is, even if it's harmless. Let's say someone's in an environment and it's not horrible, but there's some issues. How does someone survive and they don't wanna move on? Just, just general tips on surviving a somewhat you know, adversarial well, writer's room. Sure, well let's take the writer's room example there. I think it's good to take a step back and say, holy cow, I'm getting paid to write for a living. I'm getting to do something that very few people get an opportunity to do. I'm not a coal miner. I'm not uh, cleaning out toxic waste from gas stations. I have one of the greatest jobs in the world that I enjoy. I get paid to go be funny every day or to write stories or whatever type of show you're on. I, I think that really helps to, to give that kind of perspective and to give yourself that kind of perspective. And also I, I think even difficult situations are fodder for future storytelling there. That, the person who's making your life miserable uh, can come in handy when you need to write that situation in a, in a script. Uh, I'll give an example from not my life, but my brother-in-law's life. He worked in the radio business, uh, still does, um, works at Pandora now. But he was at a traditional radio station, was a general manager of several stations in the Bay Area, and his company had gotten gobbled up by a larger media conglomerate. And the new Uber boss called all of the Bay Area station managers into a meeting and said to them, my goal is to make sure that by the time Christmas rolls around, the competition's children all have one less gift under the tree. Well, I think that's just a nightmare. I, I mean, I can't, that's what gets this guy's motor running is bringing unhappiness to someone else's children. But I'm sure holding on to that as a piece of dialogue someday when I wanna write that scene. So I, you know, I, I think you, everything's material for you and you'll take that as a plus. And, and I think you can also learn, let's say you're in a writer's room where there are people you don't get along with. I think you learn how not to behave so that someday when you're a showrunner, you remember to not behave that way. And it's really important. I, um, one of my early jobs after Cosby was on a show called The Facts of Life. And a lovely woman named Irma Kalish was the showrunner for much of the time I was there. And she treated everybody with respect and dignity, and I learned a ton from her about how to treat people on a show. And I'm happy to say that now uh, her son is, act her, excuse me, her grandson is one of my students at uh, Dodge College at Chapman University. 
So that, that and she's still alive. She's in her late 80s and still writing. So the point is you can learn how to behave or you can learn how not to behave depending on what environment you're in.